If you missed your chance to experience the Laurel Museum's 2014 exhibit, Lost and Found Laurel, in person, you're in for a treat. Join me for a personalized tour as we'll take a closer look at each section and just about every artifact, including the ones you may not have noticed. I'll show you what went into the exhibit and we'll explore the places they came from. Laurel Historical Society Executive Director Lindsay Baker will explain the broader context of the show and we'll revisit what turned out to be the museum's busiest opening day of all time, an event Laurel Leader columnist Jeff Dudley described as less like an exhibit opening and more like a family reunion. I'm Richard Friend, and this is Lost Laurel. Lost and Found Laurel was the 2014 exhibit at the Laurel Museum, running from February 9th to December 21st. I'm proud to say that it was largely inspired by my Lost Laurel blog and Facebook page, and coincided with my book, which you can find in the museum's gift shop and on their website. This was the view upon entering the exhibit. Signs, photos, and artifacts, Laurel memories everywhere. Where does one look first? Let's start with the intro panel, which besides welcoming you to the museum, featured a mall-like directory of the categories, including sections on entertainment, shopping, libraries, community events, restaurants, schools, and the racial tension of the late 1960s, a reminder that the good old days weren't always good. One of the first things you'll see, and the highlight of the Let's Go Out section, is this sign from the Laurel Drive-In Theater. The sign originally stood on the corner of Marshall Avenue and Staggers Lane, just across from the bowling alley, and directed traffic to the back entrance of the theater. Wineland's Laurel Drive-In opened in 1966 and closed in 1984. The largest piece in the exhibit is this Hershey's ice cream sign, which hung for decades over Main Street's popular newsstand, Keller's, and later Knapp's Laurel News Agency. Open since 1947, the property was sold in 1995, and the sign removed and added to the Laurel Historical Society's collection. Behind the Hershey sign and over the mantle is a section of wallpaper like no other. It's made entirely of vintage matchbook covers from one-time Laurel businesses. Some are from franchises, others from individual shops. The matchbooks span a range from the 1940s to the 2000s. Also prominent in the main area is this case of over 20 vintage toy trucks, each representing a Lost Laurel business. Department stores, grocery stores, drug stores, and more, these date from the 1950s to the early 90s and are various sizes. They've always reminded me of the old Baltimore Colts in 1984, packing up and leaving town in those Mayflower moving trucks. Most of these stores, one way or another, left Laurel. Others, like Safeway and Giant, have seen multiple locations. Due to space, we didn't include some that are still in their original packages, but here they are, just as you would have bought them in the store years ago. The 
glass case in the center of the room holds another unique collection. Soda cans from the likes of Dart Drug, Drug Fair and People's Drug, Pantry Pride and even Howard Johnson's. These are all from the 1960s and 70s. Below them is a juicer that once made lemonade at Gavril's on Main Street. Also in the case is an assortment of Lost Laurel employee badges, name tags from businesses that are no longer here. Also inside are a bowling pin and award patches from Fairlane's Laurel, and vintage artifacts from Bell's Beauty Salon and the Vogue Dress Shop. In front of the case is a small homage to Fife Service Center, including an original bar stool and liquor licenses. There's also this photo of the Fife's Pride Ramblin' Raft Race team, who not only survived the beer-fueled aquatic festivities, but actually won it. Another showcase holds even more assorted material representing past and present places to shop. Among them, Montgomery Ward's catalogs, a Laurel Lake Center directory, and a 1950s Chamber of Commerce membership badge. Framed plastic shopping bags from Zares and James Way, and shopping baskets from Ames and Woolworths. There's even a miniature replica of a 1980s Laurel Center Mall directory kiosk. And yes, it even lights up. Rounding out the shop till you drop section of the exhibit is this corner, which features artifacts from Cook's Hardware, including receipts, an apron, and this original antique cash register. Before we head over to the other side of the building, let's hear from Laurel Historical Society Executive Director Lindsay Baker and get the museum's perspective of the exhibit as well as a preview of what's to come in 2015. It was inspired by the Lost Laurel blog and Facebook page. We noticed how many followers the Facebook page had and started a conversation with Richard Friend about what he had done capturing the essence of Laurel's past. Based on that conversation and subsequent exhibits committee meetings, we decided to incorporate the found aspect into it because we know that there's a lot of great things happening in Laurel and we wanted to honor that. So our exhibit Lost and Found Laurel um, is really a hyper-local exhibit. People come in and it really makes them remember their past um, and we have a lot of different sections which remind people of different pieces of their lives. For example, um, I'm sitting in the school section and we have a number of yearbooks uh, right in front of me and those yearbooks are ones that anyone can you know pick up look through find themselves find their mother their husband um, and I cannot tell you how many times I've come in here and seen people finding themselves or people that they know in the yearbooks and it's really been a piece that people seem to like a lot and respond to um, other sections include the shopping section um, we have information about historic places in Laurel like Cook's or um, uh, the pharmacy and just different things but we also have the Laurel Town Center which when we opened the exhibit had not yet opened in Laurel and now it has and since then we've had the property manager come in and we've had people who are excited to see themselves in this exhibit even before they opened and now that they've had the grand opening. Um, we have another section all about the celebrations that take place in Laurel. One of our panels is all about places you can eat out in Laurel or that were favorite spots to, to check out on date night or with your family historically. And uh, this is mostly from the 1960s to now, 2014. And one of the places that people always remember is Delaney's Irish Pub, which was located on 197. Um, and they hired a little person to dress up as a leprechaun and did a lot of promotions related to that, including um, come sit and have Santa sit on your lap. And uh, people always get a chuckle when they see that part of the exhibit because they remember that restaurant. Um, we also have another section that we thought was important um, titled the good old days question mark because people like to remember all the good things that happened um, in Laurel when they were growing up. But we also want to make a point to 
talk about some of the things that weren't as positive. So in that section, we talk about the 1960s and the 1970s in Laurel, where there was a very active KKK. Um, there was a time when the Grove was shut down because uh, there were attacks made on houses in the Grove. And so we want to make sure that we do not ignore that part of Laurel's history and people remember that there were great things happening, but in the past, some things were not as positive for everyone in the community. So we've included that. Our exhibit opening happened the second weekend in February, which is traditionally when we always open. It's usually on Super Bowl Sunday. And the opening this year was about 150 people um, in a matter of two or three hours. And for us, that was double our normal amount. Normally we get 40 to 60. Um, it was impossible to walk through the space. There were so many people in the museum and because this exhibit reaches people in a really emotional way and a way that makes them remember their friends and their family growing up and different experiences in their lives everyone wanted to hang out so not only did we have 150 people in that span but we had 150 people that wanted to stay and wanted to point out things to their friends point out things to their families and it was a really great experience i think uh jeff dudley from the old town uh, column in the Laurel Leader said that it was more like a family reunion um, than an exhibit opening and for us that's that's a great thing to hear because what we want is people coming and connecting with one another based on our exhibit and we couldn't have asked for anything better than that opening. Last week we had our holiday open house and during the open house we had a lot of different families coming in and a lot of people doing their their holiday shopping but we were really excited to see it was a young woman with um, three daughters I believe and she was carrying one and she had a couple running around and checking out the exhibit and we have one portion where we have a map um, and it has all the businesses with little like numbers on the map so you can find where they are because if you say something was on 198 198 is pretty long uh, so getting a sense of where all the businesses and all the different things in the exhibit were located and I, I saw the woman there for five or ten minutes with her two young children engaged in the map and explaining to them where the things were that they had seen in the exhibit and um, where they lived and where their schools were and it was a really great um, opportunity to see this woman engaging with her kids in the exhibit in exactly the way that we hoped that they would. So that was a wonderful experience to close out the exhibit before we take it down. Um, so in, in February of 2015, we're planning to open our next exhibit. Uh, the tentative title is Ripped from the Headlines, Laurel in the News. And the impetus behind this exhibit is our acquisition of the Laurel Leaders from the Laurel Library. So we currently have 1946 to 1981 in hardbound copies that um, are very large. If you've ever been to the library to do research, you've seen them. And we also have digitized 1897 to 2008. And I'll repeat that, 1897 to 2008 of our local newspaper has been digitized by the Laurel Historical Society. So we have full access to all those newspapers and we're working on ways to make them more accessible to our public. The public is always welcome to come in and look through those. We're trying to figure out a way to get them online so people can look through the newspapers from their own homes. And so the upcoming exhibit, ripped from the headlines, Laurel in the News, is all related to news stories in Laurel. Some of them are a little less positive than others. Um, and what we've tried to talk about is using the news as a way to understand how um, crime was solved or how natural disasters were reacted to. And also we're trying to use it as a lens to understand how news is reported. That's something that people talk about a lot today, um, the bias in news, and we think that we can use our local newspaper to think about that as well. We're excited about that exhibit. It's still in the works. We're looking to open it in February of 2015, so um, stay tuned for more information. This section of the exhibit touches on the city's celebrations and includes early artifacts from the Main Street Festival, Fourth of July parades, and Riverfest, all of which are still well attended today. In this case are several pieces related to Laurel's centennial celebration of 1970, including flyers, souvenir ribbons, buttons, and a decorative plate. Another case holds photos and other mementos from various neighborhood events, 
more Main Street Festival goodness, and other parades and public gatherings, where fun is had come rain or shine. There are also some souvenirs from Petrucci's Dinner Theater, and for those who enjoyed their movies in the comfort of home, the familiar yellow bag and tape cases from Errol's Video Club. Our next stop is all about the food. The yummy section is chock full of memories from Laurel's restaurants and fast food places. Posters and signage set the tone, but there's much more to be discovered in this room. Ice cream containers from the Tasty Freeze, coffee cans from Something Special, and a 1940s placemat from the California Inn set atop the mantel. In the center is a unique table setting with vintage trays and menus from the past, combined with some of the found treasures of today, like the Double Dipper Ice Cream Parlor. There's a heavy big tea presence, and rightfully so. Nearly six years after its demolition, the popular restaurant is still fondly remembered. In the corner, in the pantry if you will, are some of my favorite pieces of the exhibition. Plates, cups, and ashtrays from a range of both mainstream and obscure restaurants, and one of the original menu boards from the Tasty Freeze. Proving that every inch of space was used for this exhibit, there's even a surprise behind this curtain, a vintage tray from Ponderosa Steakhouse. On the other side of this false wall is the Schoolhouse Rock section, which invites visitors to explore the schools of Laurel. There are jackets, shirts, patches, and pennants from various eras, representing Laurel High and Pilate, as well as many of the middle and elementary schools we grew up with. You're even encouraged to have a seat in one of these old school desks and peruse copies of vintage student newspapers like the Tatler and look through the museum's extensive collection of yearbooks. A built-in chalkboard invites visitors to add their school years to the wall. And while none went as far back as this 1926 Laurel High pennant, there were plenty of classes represented. If you didn't have a chance to see the exhibit in person, or if you missed a few spots in all the excitement of opening day, I hope this has given you a good sense of the scope and level of effort that went into creating Lost and Found Laurel at the Laurel Museum. I know I speak for everyone involved when I say it was a terrific experience, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Join me next time as we'll explore date night in Laurel, the movie theaters, restaurants, and other favorite dating spots of Laurelites throughout the generations, including what might have been the ultimate date night, the 1969 Laurel Pop Festival. It's all on the next episode of Lost Laurel.